<laughs> You're my kind of person, though. Ohio yeah. Linux. some kind of data volume support. 
and being able to track that across multiple boxes that you may deploy to, that gets difficult. And that's a single app. We have a lot of apps. How many people are deploying more than one application, whether it's inter for internal use or anything else? There's quite a few hands going up. That can be difficult. Kubernetes is going to help. So among the features of Kubernetes that it totes, it's container spec agnostic. You can use Docker, you can use Rocket, and you can do it right now. That's a, that's a goal of the project, and that's going to be a thing for the long term. Resource-based scheduling. Kubernetes is smart enough to go out and look at, the, look at the servers that it's watching over, and it can look at the CPU, it can look at memory usage, and it can look at the number of things that it's scheduled to that box to begin with and make sure that it's not overburdening your boxes. This scheduler is getting smarter all the time. Where it was a year ago and where it is now are night and day different. It's amazing. Services for load balancing, because once you get your containers inside of a cluster, if you have two containers that are somewhere in a, in a cluster of 14 or so boxes, where are those containers at? Kubernetes gives you an abstraction to help you get your traffic where it needs to go. And I'll do a demonstration, we'll see that. A robust API is also important to this because we want to be able to deploy our apps with minimal headache. This API is so robust that several components of Kubernetes actually operates entirely through the API. So the same API that the scheduler works through, you work through. That's pretty awesome, in my opinion. And great CLI tooling via a fantastic tool called kubectl. And we'll see during the demonstration the cool things that you can do with kubectl for deploying, for deploying containers, for doing some debugging stuff, services, all that jazz. It's going to be great. Watch for it. So what, is a, so what does a simple Kubernetes cluster look like? Well, we have a master, and then we have some number of nodes. The master is typically where your administration is going to go. Um, your API server is live, going to live there. If you have a Docker cache, a uh, Docker image cache or something to that effect, it'll usually live on the master. And then you have the nodes. And the Kubernetes definition of a node is a physical or a virtual machine on which containers can be scheduled. There's nothing else to it. It does the work. So then the question is, in Kubernetes, in the Kubernetes land, we want to get the things that we want to run to our node. What do we call the unit that we do, that we deploy? If you say a container, you're close, but keep in mind, we may have multiple containers, or we may have data volumes that we want to go across, that we want to go with it when we deploy it. So then we need a unit to describe, to describe what that is. In Kubernetes lingo, that's called a pod. And they define a pod as a co-located set of application containers and shared data volumes. This is the smallest unit that can be scheduled inside of Kubernetes. Let's take a look at the, so let's take a little bit closer look at what we can do to get our pods. For one thing, I said that containers, that pods can have more than one container. So if you're linking containers, this is how you're going to do it in Kubernetes land. But I also mentioned that it can do data volumes. And the data volume support is awesome. No question. Among the data volumes Kubernetes supports, it can do Amazon Web Services, Elastic Block Storage volumes. Google Cloud Engine, persistent disk volumes, NFS shares, and I'm not even making this up, you can point it to a Git repository and check out a particular checkout to stick inside your container. That sounds completely crazy, but if you're storing configuration inside of Git and you want to pull that inside of your container, that's handy. And I'm not even, and I'm not even touching this, like I'm not barely scratching the surface of what it has. There's more, there's Gluster FS, there's a secrets API that Kubernetes introduced. And if you guys are like us, that's one thing that we've been talking a lot about, is how do we share secrets with our containers when they're out of production? I, am, I beg you, go look at the data volumes in the Kubernetes documentation. There's tons of them. You'll love it, I promise. And if not, tell me about it on Twitter. So how can we organize pods? If we have a lot of, if we have a lot of pods, and for example, in my cluster that I personally maintain, I have 400 pods. That's a lot. How do I organize those pods, or for that matter, any other Kubernetes resource? And the resources in Kubernetes
measures we've seen so far are pods and nodes. So how do we organize these? Well, in Kubernetes, we call that a label. And they define a label as a key pair value or key value pair that we use to organize resources. So let's take it, let's look at an example of this. Let's say we have a pod. And here's the rep and here's a really ugly representation of our pod. I'm not good with graphics. We call so we've lovingly named our pod important microservice because it's super important. Here's our Docker image, and you'll notice that I'm using the latest Docker. I'm using the latest Docker image. This is probably the head of my production, right? I've given it two labels. One of them, one of my labels, represents the environment that I that this pod is operating in, and I call it production. This is probably this is probably where my production traffic is going, and it's using server, nginx. I don't know why I labeled that. I did. The interesting thing about labels is that you can then differentiate between pods that are operating in a production capacity and a pod that's operating in a QA capacity or any other kind of testing that you might like to do. So if you look here, I have a second pod that I've deployed a feature branch to. In my feature branch, I've set the environment to QA. So I can very quickly filter between these two pods using kubectl. I can tell the difference, and people that want to test something can deploy to an environment that's a lot like what they're going to get when they, when they deploy to production. The other magic, too, is that if I want to search for things that are NGINX, thank you for the follow, whoever just followed me. <laughs> I don't know why I did that. The, um, if I want to filter out, if I want to filter out servers, I can simply search for server engine X and both of those will pop up. And that's useful and maybe I maybe there's a maybe I need to quickly figure out what what uh, Docker images I'm gonna need to update because oh no security thing happened. The cool thing about this, you can do it with nodes too. So here's an example that I hope plays to the sensibilities of this room. I have three nodes in a in a physical data center that I have, and I have named, and I have two of these nodes live on a rack called Tatooine. One of these nodes live on a rack that I've lovingly called Alderan. Let's say that a system administrator decides to do the equivalent of a laser beam and destroy rack Alderan. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> we can very quickly figure out what Kubernetes nodes or would be affected by Alderaan being destroyed in, a, in something that would let the Jedi know that something is amiss. Um, that's really cool, and thank you for laughing at that. I worked hard on that. <laughs> okay. Does everybody, is everybody with me so far? I take silence as okay. So now we have pods. We have labels to represent, to, to let us filter down to pods. And now the question is, if we want to have replicas for high availability, what do, we, what do we want to use? As my subtitle says, there's a Kubernetes resource for that. We call that a replication controller. And a replication controller, and a replication controller helps us manage the life cycle of pods by ensuring that the desired number of pods exist. Here's, here's an example. Here we have a replication controller that we specified. And we've said that we want two replicas. Now, here's the, so here's the kicker about how, here's the kicker about how um, replication controllers work in Kubernetes. Replication controllers have something called a selector. The selector watches labels for pods that match that selector. So you can see here that I have a selector, and it's a label that's app equal user service. Any pod that has a label app equals user service is going to be watched over by the replication controller. Now, this is simplified. You're probably going to have more labels than this, but it's a simple, it's a simple, um, it's, you know. So, Let's say that we have a replication controller that desires to have two replicas. 
And we have two pods that that replication controller is watching because our selectors match our labels for our pod. Let's say that pod two has a bad day. I have no idea why, but it's dead. That happens. And that's the face we make every time it happens. Man, I have no idea why, but that's too bad. But, but, Kubernetes is ready for that. Specifically, the controller manager is ready for that. Kubernetes starts up a new pod for us. And it watches that pod through a help check that it does through the Docker daemon. Alternatively, you can configure HTTP help checks. And that pod has come back to life. And that replication controller has done its job. It's happy. And then we make that face. Because it's alive. OK. So now we have, so now we have, so now we've, uh, so now we have a replication controller with multiple, with multiple replicas that we're ready to serve traffic to. But we may have two containers inside of our, inside of a 12 node cluster or more. How do we get traffic? How do we get traffic to this guy? Kubernetes provides an abstract, uh, provides a thing called a service. It's a resource. By definition, a service provides a safe, single stable endpoint for a set of pods. You can think of this, I was really aggressive when I said you, I'm sorry. You can think of it like a round robin load balancer. Here's, here's an example. I'll touch on this a little bit, but this is the general idea. We have a client. The client hits the, client hits the service. We've named our service user microservice. And Kubernetes, has picked a, and Kubernetes, when we create the service, will pick a high numbered port on which to serve it on. Notice we have a selector here. This selector tells us what pods to forward traffic to. So in a round robin fashion, that service is going to forward that traffic to those pods with those matching, with those matching labels. This is fantastically, this is fantastically handy. And I'm going to demonstrate that for you live here on stage and hope I don't make a wire out of myself. Okay. So we're all, so a lot of people in here are probably system guys. One of the things that I hear a lot about Kubernetes is that it's complex, in that there are a lot of things that you have to have to get up and running. There's a lot of part, there are a lot of um, processes that have to be running. I'm going to step through those right now. Um, I'm not going to show you system D units or anything like that. However, if you look at my slides later, I do have a I do um, have a link to a repository that will set up a um, CoreOS cluster using Vagrant on your local box, which is what I'm going to do my demos from. So you can play with this, you can look at their system, their cloud configs, and you can check that out yourself. So what components make up Kubernetes? Well, on the master, obviously we have the API server. The API server serves requests for the API. Yeah. We have two other processes. We have the cube scheduler and we have the controller manager. On the node, we have a thing called Kubelet, and then we have Kubeproxy. And we're going to step through each one of those starting with the master. The Kube API server, as I said, services REST operations. As I mentioned before, most things in Kubernetes operate through the API server, and it provides the, it provides the binding that, holds, that puts everything together. It also validates and sets data for the resources. So if you pass it nonsense, the API server is going to be the component that tells you no. The second is the cube scheduler. And the scheduler performs scheduling of the pods. And it considers a lot of things whenever it's trying to determine where to schedule. Among that, resource requirements, CPU utilization, memory utilization, and then just an arbitrary check to make sure you don't deploy too many pods to a box. The API the scheduler is going to take that into consideration. The data locality. And as I understand this, as I understand this, it's going to try to you, it's going to try to mount things that have external data volumes. If multiple things need it, it's going to try to put those together for you. Process affinity and anti-affinity. If we have replication controllers putting two contain or two pods on the same box, it doesn't make any sense. So we have so we have those considerations to make sure that our pods go to different boxes, among other things. 
Cube Controller Manager. This is the guy that's actually watching Kubernetes and making sure, and making sure that, um, and making sure that the replication controllers are satisfied. As they put it, it makes changes to make the actual state of pods match the desired state of pods. So if you have a repl so if you have a pod that goes down and a replication controller needs to take care of it, the controller manager is going to be the thing that helps you out. Now let's go on to the node. Kubelet is, Kubelet is, both of the things that are running on the node are very interesting, but Kubelet, I, for some reason, is my favorite. I have no idea why. Kubelet is what ensures that the pod specifications are met on a node, meaning if you have multiple, if you have multiple pods with containers that need to be running, Kubelet is what's going to ensure that this, that these are all running. It's also going to ensure that data volumes are mounted properly. It also ensures the containers are healthy. As I mentioned before, Kubernetes can do checks through the Docker daemon, through HTTP checks, and by this point, probably more. Kubelet also does this really handy thing where it does garbage collection on containers and images on your nodes. Because when you fill up disk space, that's generally a bad day. So Kubelet's going to keep an eye on that. Kubelet, by default, what it will do is it'll wait until you get to some percentage disk utilization, and then it'll clean out images to get back to some utilization. This is a pretty handy thing because if you have because if you have something that really isn't considering that isn't really considering what it's throwing away, you potentially, if you have to do a rollback in the event that we deploy bad code, if you have to roll back, you don't want to have to wait for a Docker image to pull. You want to be able to get it deployed as fast as possible. So that's a pretty cool, that's a pretty cool thing in Q1. And then QProxy. What QProxy actually does, if you recall, I said that a service will forward traffic to the to the proper pod. QProxy in QProxy is one of the things that helps you do that. QProxy runs on all of the nodes, and when it sets up, when a service is created, it adjusts, it uses IP tables currently to adjust routing such that traffic to a particular port that's open gets forwarded to one of the pods inside of the cluster. This QProxy can forward TCP and UDP streams, or it can do UDP just step straight packet forwarding. It's configured, as I said, by a Kubernetes service. So we're going to go back to the imagery of we're going to go back to the imagery of the of the uh, service. QProxy is the thing that's pushing is pushing that along. Um, I'm deliberately being a little simple here. It, networking in Kubernetes can be a little daunting. It can be a little tough. But I have 40 minutes to or 40 or 45 minutes to convince you to go try it. And if I hit overlay networking, we're going to be here until past that. And so I'm simplifying this a little bit. However. If you look at the if you look at the um, if you look at the uh, if you look at the repository in my slides later, it will set up an overlay networking for you, and you can get going and you can worry about the details of that later. Oh, oh, oh. all right, now it's time for fun. Just to prove that I'm not full of garbage, th this okay. So before I go on, that that's fun. Here's the uh, here's the GitHub repository for the, uh, the, a simple Kubernetes vagrant setup. It uses CoreOS. This is what I'm using for my demonstration. In my slides, I've got all of the examples that I'm going to do. You can follow along later on. So don't worry about taking notes right now. Let's just have a good time and hope this thing works. Oh man. Mm. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do. So the first thing we want to do is we want a repl we want a replication controller. In the Kubernetes, so when we're when Kubernetes can either use JSON or YAML for configuration. Okay, what we're looking at here is a replication controller configuration that will launch my that will launch my web my my blog inside of a Docker container running Nginx. The best demo ever. So. Looking at this, we see the API version. This is generally going to be v1. There's been uh, beta versions of the API, and that's just the convention that we see. 
We're defining a replication controller type. And then we hit a section called metadata. Yes! Sorry about that, guys. I don't think this is all. Has it even been picking me up the whole time? I seem louder now. <laughs> so anyway. Anyway. Um, Man, that just really interrupted my flow. Yes. <laughs> it's like, I'm done. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> Man. Um, so the metadata. So this metadata is just information about our controller. This, doesn't, this is just information to help us out. So we have a name, and then we have labels. And the labels just help us filter, filter things. Filter things, um, filter things, and we'll see an example of that later. And then we have the spec, and the spec is actually what's telling us information about this, about this um, replication controller. So you see here we have two replicas, and then we have the selector, which tells us the labels of the pods that we want to have monitored. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as that is. After that, we have a template that we're going to use. That, we're going, that, that the replication controller is going to use when it's starting new pods. And so we have a metadata just for that, that we're, lab, that we're labeling our pods with name blog pod. And then we have a specification for that. And the specification for that, we see that we have a single container named blog container. We have an image. And then we have um, the container port, which is specifying the port that's in use inside of our Docker container. You know, Docker, we have a port outside of, we have a port that Docker is serving on to the rest of the world, and then we have the port inside the container that Docker, that Docker is listening on for the application. This container port represents that internal port. Okay. Moment of truth right here. So now we're going to create, so now we're going to, oops, spoiler alert, we're going to create that blog. Yes. Okay. So, at this point, this is going to be the most amazing thing you see all day. Actually, that is surprising. <laughs> <laughs> that is really unfortunate. Um, hmm. I swear, I've done this like six times today, and it's just... Well, so somebody, it would be Jeff Pullen out here in the audience, told me yesterday that I kind of probably doomed myself when I said my demo was going to go fine. <laughs> He's back there somewhere, huh? Knock on something. Knock on something. Did you do that network access for a bit? Uh, if I could. Yeah. Yep, if you could help me with that, this demo would be a lot less awful. <laughs> I can't believe that. I disabled my network at the house. Oh, okay. What's the... Uh, yeah, no doubt. What's the um? Bill's iPhone. I really appreciate it. You're a wonderful person. It's like, can you show that? I'm just gonna change the password when I'm done, guys. <laughs> Troll a little. Lull. So we'll see if this, uh... ah, there we go, we got it. I will have a discussion with you later, Mr. Uh, computer. So, <laughs> oh man. So at this point, our controller, our pods are running at this point. Lord have mercy. Or they're working on it. Um, so what you see here, so what you see here is um, kubectl has another verb in addition to create called git. Git is a Git will uh, give us a list of information about about our um, about our the things that are, are the resources that are running inside of Kubernetes. So you see here that we have two pods running. We have a ready state here. Uh, we see that one of one of our containers are running. The status is running, and it's seven hours old. Okay, Kubernetes, you're just upsetting me right now. That's weird. Okay, fine. So we can do the same thing with replication controllers, and we can see, uh, you know, we can use git rc. It's a shorthand for replication controllers. 
and that's the replication control that we created. Okay. So, like I said, we can do git pods, we can see that. But Kubernetes lets us go a step further with the describe, with the describe verb. And so we can say, we can say kubectl describe, and we give it a resource name, and we give it a pod name, 